Today, we are so thrilled to have Dr. Michael Hayden with us from Polenia Therapeutics. And I wanted to also say happy Huntington's Disease Awareness Month as we are celebrating this important community, raising awareness and also raising that hope that's needed with future of care and the spirit that is within all of us within this important community. My name is Jenna Heilman, Executive Director of HDO, and this is also our premiere of our new program, but it's called HDYOU, so HDU, and this is really a way for the community to share information in order to impact the community. And so as we continue to grow this program, you'll see different ambassadors, you'll have Matt, myself, Seth Rotberg and other community members interviewing people who make a difference every single day. And so we're thrilled to start this off with, with Dr. Hayden. And so I'll let Dr. Hayden introduce himself. Well, I'm Michael Hayden. What a privilege and thrill it is to be uh, have this opportunity to talk to the HD and the broader community. I am a physician scientist uh, who first saw Huntington disease patients when I was young and impressionable as a medical student in South Africa in the late 70s. And those experiences with families and with Huntington disease, exploring uh, what they lived like, visiting them every single mental institution in South Africa and seeing what this disease did to them, the burden, but also the courage and the resilience imprinted me uh, to commit my own scientific and medical endeavors to do what I could uh, to say yes to the challenge of Huntington disease and try to do something throughout my life that might have some impact. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. And I know you have such an extensive experience working with patients. So how did you transition that almost that bench side patient interaction into turning that into helping on the back end when it comes to pharmaceutical and drug development? Well, you know, I started off as a, an intern um, and I was told when I first saw families with Huntington disease, I was told it wasn't Huntington disease. It was another inherited form of career. Uh, and there were almost no articles written on Huntington disease in Africa. But in those days, you went to visit people in their homes and there were people from one bedroom to another. There were children with the rigid form of this disease. And everything I read told me this was Huntington disease. And then as part of my thesis work, I traveled to every single mental institution, institution in South Africa and saw about a thousand patients. And I, was, uh, I, I saw the, uh, the, the lack of awareness, the ignorance that occurred in this disease. And I also spent time in people's homes where I was moved by their courage, their resilience. Many of these people were people of color, of mixed descent. They were disenfranchised by apartheid and also disenfranchised by Huntington disease for which there was almost no awareness. So I was moved by that. I was moved by the challenge. There was no book on Huntington disease ever written at that stage, no single author monograph that had ever been written. And then around that time, I was asked to talk on Huntington disease in Africa by a Congress uh, by Marjorie Guthrie. Uh, and Marjorie Guthrie invited me as part of a Huntington disease group in, and I came in the late 70s uh, to, uh, to this meeting. I met Marjorie Guthrie, uh, who became like a, a beautiful friend and inspiration. And Marjorie said to me, you know, you've got to come to America. Uh, and I said, well, I'd like to, but uh, I, I would need to come with some idea that I could be permanently to dedicate my life to this purpose. And Marjorie was able to get Senator Kennedy to write to the Immigration Naturalization Service. Uh, and I met Senator Kennedy later, who told me he remembered writing that letter, who knows. 
Um, and I was able to go, but Senator Kennedy said, you can come, but on one condition that you go to Boston. Um, I didn't know where Boston was. Uh, uh, I had to look it up on the map to see whether it was on the East or West Coast. Um, and so I went to Children's Hospital uh, and, uh, and Marjorie stayed very close to Marjorie. In fact, next week I'm meeting Marjorie's daughter, Nora, in New York, and we're going to the Morgan Library to see the exhibition uh, of Woody Guthrie, who was such an inspiration and led and obviously died of Huntington disease in 1967 and led Marjorie to work to uh, increase the education, uh, the, the awareness, decrease the stigma. And it was Marjorie who became a source of great inspiration. And if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have been in America or in North America at all. And who knows whether I would have been able to pursue what I've done. So as I continued to work on this and shortly thereafter, the gene, uh, the first linked marker for Huntington disease genetically was discovered in 1983. I recognized that there was stuff we could, there were things we could do with that, even predictive testing. And we did the first predictive testing in 1986 in Vancouver. And I was drawn to the community again, that was very open, welcomed me, uh, set up the first DNA and Huntington disease tissue bank which now has over 6,000 samples, 300 brain samples, a huge opportunity. And with that research, uh, it became clear to me that if I really wanted to have some opportunity for impact, I need to go to what used to be called the dark side. For me, it's the light side. And it's the light side, which is how do you translate fundamental discovery, which is so crucial, into opportunities for drug development. We need drugs that can have impact on neurodegeneration, neuroprotection. And so I uh, accepted an offer to be president of Global R&D of Teva on the condition that I could continue to work in Huntington disease. Mm -hmm. And we brought in uh, two drugs into Teva that uh, the first was uh, dutetrabenazine, which became only the second drug ever to be approved in the United States for Huntington disease. But I knew that wasn't enough because that drug is very effective for Korea. And there's now a trial also with Neurocrine where they did Ingressa, essentially the same mechanism of action. It decreases dopamine, a, a chemical in the brain that causes Korea when it's excessive. So it decreases it. And this drug is very useful for abnormal movements, but really doesn't prolong the disease, doesn't slow the progression. And I, felt very drawn to another drug because patients on trials with pridopidine had told me that they appeared to be doing better, that progression wasn't as fast. And so I brought this drug into Teva and I was able to take the drug with me when I left. And because we began to understand the biology of this drug and the biology was that it didn't act on dopamine receptors at the, at the levels that were being uh, given to patients, but rather had impact on a very novel receptor called the Sigma-1 receptor. And this receptor, there was already quite a lot of data suggesting that if you could increase the activity of Sigma-1, you could provide protection. And so I was able to take this with me. Also, the people who worked on this drug came with me because they had already seen some of the data that at least uh, pros the hypothesis that we should really do a proper formal clinical trial. And we formed Prolenia. And Prolenia, P-R-I, which is predopidine, Lenia means soothe or cure. It's an aspiration. It's a hope. Sick people with Huntington disease depend on us, depend on all persons not only doing fundamental research, but committed to translation into products and services of multiple forms in an effort to alleviate and reduce the suffering of this disease. So, you know, I found a way to say yes. Say yes, that we can still continue basic research and try and turn the mission impossible to a mission possible, that this was possible. And so, uh, you know, it was very hard in the beginning. We had to raise the money for a clinical trial. Uh, this drug had also had a history where it hadn't been successful in some instances. And so we had to get over that and then designed the clinical trial based on the data that we'd seen before that gave us reason to believe. 
And this is the trial that's now ongoing. It's called Proof HD. And what does Proof stand for? Predopidine for outcome of HD. And of course, the most important thing for me that I learned from families, and this had impact in South Africa big time, but then everywhere, is that people want to continue living independently. They want to continue uh, working. They want to continue dressing themselves. They continue eating, continue to take care of themselves, continuing to walk with their children and grandchildren, and continue to have a life that's prolonged with as much function as possible without the suffering that's inevitable. And so uh, as we learned about this drug, we saw that this was a possibility. It's not a, it's not a definite because you do a trial, a phase three clinical trial in an effort to test a hypothesis. We're testing it. We have reason to believe and we have optimism and confidence, but uh, the trial, there's no prediction uh, until you get the results. We will have the results about a year from now, not very long from now. And what's been so amazing is that this trial is being conducted in 30 sites in North America, five in Canada, 25 in the United States, nine countries in Europe. And uh, despite COVID, we were very worried when we started the trial that COVID would have big impact on limiting the recruitment. People could, the hospitals were closed, the clinics were closed. Uh, but in fact, to our really delight, uh, the community has been incredibly supportive. The lay organizations, uh, HDO, many organizations really made the, uh, the community aware. And we recruited ahead of schedule despite COVID and more people than expected. And what happened at the end, we got to the number, but there were another 20 people who had already had appointments. And we said, we can't say no to that. So we included them in the trial and we enrolled about 499 patients, basically 500. And there've been a few things that have given me hope right now. Firstly, the drug is very safe and tolerable. You know, in any trial that you do, people drop out of the trial and it's quite common. We estimated the dropout rate may be as high as 20%. And so you power your study for a dropout that has you know, that number. Well, here we are 15, 16 months into the study and we're less than 4%. So uh, it's still a way to go. It's gonna go up, but it's remarkably low for a drug that acts on the CNS. And furthermore, um, there's been no serious adverse events related to the drug so far. So we're, uh, we're encouraged by that, but it's still early days. You have to finish a trial to do full analysis. So this is all you know, early. Uh, not no conclusions to be drawn. We have to wait for the results of the trial when the blind is open and everybody can see the data. But it's I must really say, as I start, as I was in South Africa and I saw, firstly, people were separated uh, um, by apartheid, but were also separated by this disease. This disease kept them at home, kept them depressed, kept them unemployed, and uh, it was very important then to form what was uh, a very unusual situation in the late 70s in South Africa, which was a multiracial uh, um, uh, family organization, the South African H, and it was filled with people of many different ancestries, and we brought them together, uh, uh, which was very unusual at that particular time, because essentially it wasn't the way the medical system was run. Mm -hmm. So I was pleased to set work to catalyze that and saw the importance of the family organizations providing support um, and providing uh, just comfort uh, for people and reaching out in ways that provided relief and comfort along the way. It's a long road. It's, a, it's been a long road. And the journey of discovery is not a short trip. It's a long journey. Uh, and we all have to travel together. We're colleagues and co-travelers on this journey, the patients, the families, and then we're co-travelers with the organizations, the lay organizations, as we work together to find solutions to this big problem. Well, you took up almost all of my questions, but I love it because you are such a passionate advocate for this community. And I think that that shows the power of the community 
working together with people who are developing the different treatments and drugs um, that, that can then go back to the community, hopefully after these trials. And it's, it's happened so organically with you um, over just your, your history and how you started. And I think it really shows great nimbleness of the fact that you had such a dedicated group of scientists around you that you were able to bring this drug with you and start something completely new and not start over with the science, but start over with the fundraising and the efforts because you had such a, a knowledge of what this this could do for the community. But I also think that the passion from what you have learned from working with families and patients and people firsthand is really so powerful and important. And I think it's important for our community to understand that there are so many scientists and people there who are championing their causes and whatever chance that they can get as they feel comfortable to continue to share their experiences because that's the only way that we can help increase that knowledge and be able to share that with the scientific community to keep um, to keep adapting and keep moving forward and to really understand what it's like every single day. And let me just say, you know, the Huntington community and families I know have been very devastated by the failures over the last year or so. And Yes, we're all devastated by that. And I'm not a believer that there'll be one uh, approach to cure or to therapy. It's gonna be combination therapy, just like it is for cancer. Uh, there'll be combinations of drugs that work in different mechanisms that potentially add additional value. Mm -hmm. But you know, the important thing is, yes, failures are awful, but really it's important to say what happens after failure? How do the failures lead to different approaches? What's new? How would we learn from that? Picked ourselves up as a community and moved on because we're not giving up. There will be failures, but we're not giving up because they're failures. Mm -hmm. And so there's no definitive outcome even for this trial. We're very hopeful, but we have to await the results. And it's important, also important to know that when I look at my own career, what moved me early, you know, there's a genetic word called imprinting. And I sort of feel um, that has biologic basis. I feel I was imprinted by Huntington families early, and it was the families that did it. It was talking to them, which was being with them. And I would say for young scientists, for to read Huntington disease, but to learn from family members about their experiences, to be moved. And that, that opportunity for imprinting early then uh, finds people committed for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need. We need young people who are not just popping in and out, but rather committed long-term. And many of the long-term researchers have been there for a long time. And you say, why? And they're drawn by the challenge, but they're also moved by the people. They move by the human stories and they move by the opportunity to have impact and do something good. Um, and so these are uh, profoundly important messages. And, you know, we're scientists, we're still humans, we have partners, we have children, some of us have grandchildren, and we, we learn from you too about how to live our own life. So it enriches our own lives. I remember um, one person coming for predictive testing uh, who uh, was told that she would has inherited the, the mutation, the spelling error causing HD, and she came to the first meeting after getting those results with a song by Tim McGraw, who I didn't know who he was either, by the way. But you, you got to live like you're dying. I don't know if you know that song. Anyway, and she read it to me and she said, Doc, you, you, this is for you. This is not about me. You've got to start living like you're dying because time is short. So make sure you, you know, beg for forgiveness from friends and, and live life fully at every moment. And so what I'm really saying it's a scientific journey for, all, for the scientists, but it's also a human journey. It's a journey that enriches our lives. It's a, Germany, a journey also that has added to the quality of our lives. And so it's a privilege and a huge and a sacred and precious responsibility. So, you know, it's not something, you can't walk away from your adopted family um, and you, it's hard. And so we just got to keep on going and we're not giving up. We're going to keep on going until we've got a way to, so we dream big, uh, stay small, 
and keep on going. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, hopefully a year from now, we'll have some great data. And if not, we'll find other ways to deal with it. So uh, we're hopeful. We have reason to believe. I mean, investors clearly have supported us and they've done deep diligence. We understand the biology, uh, but it's not done then because this will just be one approach. There'll be many approaches used in combination just as it is for many other diseases. Ideally, we want a safe and tolerable drug. We would don't want to do harm. Uh, and we may want to make sure that we don't in any way make patients worse, that's for sure. That's a dreadful outcome. Mm -hmm. But we want to then keep on going, add different approaches to this, and then just remember about social supports and other things. It's not just about drugs. It's so much more than that. We need, you know, we need the drugs, just like we needed vaccination for COVID. But we need more than that. We need to reduce the stigma. We need to reduce the, the uh, prejudice that still exists uh, for this disease and many others, particularly genetic diseases. These are rare diseases, for, but with huge impact. The impact is so beyond the number of people who are affected. It's, the, it's people like you. It's your friends, it's your partners, it's people who worry about you because of your family. It's, it has impact throughout the community that we live in. So the numbers uh, are affected are so much greater than just the number of people with the disease. And um, so if we can do something, uh, this would lift a curtain uh, of despair and have a, a curtain of hope and hopefully some sunshine uh, for a while, if possible. Yeah, that's amazing. And um, a couple of things that that I'm taking away too is the encouragement to continue to get involved. And sometimes it can seem like such a daunting thing for people who um, have lives, you know, when we know that life happens, but, you know, young people to share their stories, talking about what it's like to be caregivers, their own personal journeys. And as we hopefully are continuing to come back and back and back to where we'll have these in-person events, I encourage the community to, to directly reach out to scientists that you see attending these events, because I think that that's really impactful too. Um, because when you, when you think about stigmas, especially around research and participating in research, there can be a lot of hesitations. And part of it is, you know, can be that scientists are, 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 you can't reach out to them and it's difficult to communicate because they're doing all of these high level studies, but really they are just people just like you're so eloquent and careful about, about making sure that you have the integrity of the community in mind with everything that you do. And that's because of your experience. So uh, everybody who's watching this, I really encourage you to continue to reach out to the scientific community and share your perspectives and one thing as well that HDO has been working on is our breaking down barriers pieces, which is really tackling those stigmas around participating in research. And so I'll put in the chat notes on here some different links, but we actually followed two young people as they participated in Enroll HD, which is, a, which is an observational study. And the reason that we're doing these different things is so that you can understand the importance, but also the humanness of clinical trials and the importance of, of what that means for the entire community community so you can decide you know, what's the best course of action and be the, the owners of your own journey. But it is a, a multifaceted approach. And so it really is important to have that true collaborative effort with the scientific community, with the advocacy groups, with the people in the community to really work together. And let me just say, yes. And you know, scientists often start out and physicians with the medical or the scientific uh, so it's initially a journey of the mind. But then what happens through the interaction with families and through the kind of reaching out and breaking down barriers, even to the scientists and the physicians, it becomes a journey of the heart. And when we combine the journey of the mind with the journey of the heart, we get long-term commitment. We get a commitment that goes far beyond the journey of the mind because it's a journey that encompasses the, all of the totality. And so I want to say thank you to people in HDO and people in the community reach out because you're actually further imprinting the next generation of researchers who will be there for the next 50 years. And th that, and you do this by really joining 
uh, the journey of the mind with the journey of the heart to become a, a, a composite journey that encourages commitment long term. Mm -hmm. and, and the one thing I would say, you know, Huntington disease, tragic, terrible disease, the genetics is tough. Um, but if we're able to do something for Huntington disease, there is a possibility, particularly if it has impact on some of the mechanisms associated with, DJ, with loss of neurons, that this will be much more broadly applicable. Mm -hmm. Because some of the, even though there are many different causes, Huntington's, Parkinson's, ALS, Alzheimer's, and other diseases, the bruise is the same and the process of healing is the same. And so when you look at that, even though the cause for these diseases is completely different, the pathways that are activated that are resulting in neuronal death and axonal injury are similar. And so there may be mechanisms if we target them that are much more broadly applicable. And eventually we may learn from Huntington disease to other diseases. And so we also have to break down the barriers between these illnesses. Often people stay in one disease and we have to learn from other diseases profoundly. You know, that there are some drugs in development, for example, a drug by Novartis that was used initially in spinal muscular atrophy. And now it was realized serendipitously that it also knocks down the Huntington gene. Well, that's just, uh, so you've gone from spinal muscular atrophy to Huntington's. Um, and so these diseases, we have to keep our mind very open to different mechanisms, different approaches, because we don't quite know where the next breakthrough will come. And we have to keep our eyes broadly and deeply and, and, and out, uh, not just focused on our own particular mechanism of action. Absolutely. And that is such an important point that we continue to push forward as well, because on the advocacy side of things, big things happen when you have large groups of people who care. And inside the community, the Huntington's disease community is amazing. And there are so many people who want to get involved in care, but it is a rare disease. And so by having these different rare disease organizations and groups and, and the scientific community coming together, we all of a sudden are a massive group of people. And that is so important when you're talking about pushing forward. Uh, I always say there's a big A and a little A advocacy. The little A is about advocating for your own journey and your own self. And big A is really making change and moving forward. And that can be coming with legislation, with, with um, working with different medical organizations and regulatory agencies like the FDA. And to have that bigger group of people that can, can champion for several different diseases is so important. And we continue as an organization to try and partner with other, um, especially neuro, neurodegenerative diseases, um, to see how we can work together and, and band forward. And, and it's, it's amazing that the science can do the same thing. And just to say, the regulatory agencies are now are very open to that kind of collaboration. We found that the regulatory agencies in the US, the FDA, and in Europe, the EMA, are incredibly supportive because there's such an unmet need. And they're you know, want rigorous data, of course, want scientific data, but also really we have found them very open. We got special status with the FDA in terms of fast track designation based on the data we presented, which means they're actually going to be even more available uh, for discussion as we go through this trial. Uh, and we're looking to have, imp and, and the EMA has also been very supportive. So we're, you know, without the community, this trial would not have been happened. So I've got to thank the whole community and thank you for being partners. And without you, there's no us. Without everybody together, there's no us. And so it is a, it's, we're bound together on this journey, uh, which will have ups and downs, but we're going to stay the course um, and uh, find ways to do something, hopefully, that can have impact on patients. One thing... I'd love to, especially with, with the population of people who, um, who we work with at HDO, thinking a lot of, of the people that we work with are pre-symptomatic. Um, and currently there are no clinical trials that addresses people until they uh, are showing symptoms. And so thinking ahead, obviously, there's a lot to still be discovered and you'll learn more in the next year, as you've said, as, as the, the science is, uh, will show the results. But what could the implications be 
if this shows and proves the hypothesis going forward for those who are either really early in, in the manifestation of symptoms or even pre-symptomatic altogether? Such, a, such an important question. And of course, one that we've thought about a lot. If this was a shield, a neuroprotective agent, then obviously it, um, you'd want to do this earlier rather than later. Um, and you can't resurrect, you can't protect neurons that are lost. By the time patients with Huntington's disease reach the diagnosis, what we call a diagnosis confidence a limit of uh, 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 confidence of four, which means absolutely clearly Huntington's, they've already lost a lot of brain cells. So ideally you'd want to treat people earlier and uh, as early as you can go. Now, the key thing is firstly showing that your drug is effective in people who have disease. If we were to show that, and that still has to be proven, then obviously the next step is to go earlier to people uh, and who are close to onset. There are potential biomarkers that could indicate uh, when a person might be beginning to have axonal injury. It's called neurofilament that appears to go up even before the diagnosis can be made. So, and there are other imaging biomarkers that also look uh, potentially promising. So you could define a group of people who are destined to be ill, but not yet put, put ill at this particular point. Mm -hmm. That would be a group of people. And you know, it's not different. The statins for heart disease were essentially initially used in people who had the disease, who had heart attacks and strokes. Then after that, once you showed that work to decrease that likelihood, then it was used for people who had a biomarker. The biomarker was blood cholesterol. And it was used then in primary prevention to try and slow the onset of heart attacks. It's not all that different here in that, firstly, we have to show secondary prevention, which is treatment of a disease that's already occurred but slowing progression as measured by some endpoints. And then you'd be able to go to treat in, in primary prevention in people destined to be ill, but not yet ill. So there's a, there are paradigms for this outside of brain disease uh, in the heart, for example, for atherosclerosis. But that model could be used very much for brain disease, and that would be a precedent. Because in the future, the dream would be that there are biomarkers for, for neuronal injury, the biomarkers for people who have cognitive impairment, and then hopefully there'd be drugs that you could treat people early so that they can remain functional and independent for much longer than would be expected. And this would, of course, have broad implications outside of Huntington's, but more broadly, and for the whole epidemic of dementia that is really creating such a problem in our community. And I know um, that that's such an important message, and there's there's some confusion uh, within the community as far as how do you, when you have gone through genetic testing and you're gene positive, do you have Huntington's disease? What is that transition to being fully diagnosed? And, and as you mentioned, as people progress um, and they are starting to have symptoms, there is that, um, that, that damage that's already being done to the brain. And so that's, I think you cleared that up really well, kind of understanding um, the progression that happens and then the need for these different biomarkers to come earlier. So then you can indicate uh, the slight progression instead of as, as soon as people are showing the chorea and the different effects, whether it's um, cognition or the emotional side of things. And so that's really important to, for the community to understand. I think eventually, hopefully, we'll be able to have a predictive test where mm -hmm. we do the prediction. We know how to do that. That's available worldwide. And then we go from prediction to prevention. Mm -hmm. So that would be the ultimate dream. Uh, at the moment, we go from predict, we go from diagnosis to treating, but we're treating people who already are diagnosed. Mm -hmm. We want to go earlier so that we can protect those neurons, provide a shield against injury, and keep those neurons as healthy as possible for as long as possible. That's the dream. It's a big dream, mm -hmm. but at least it's in sight. We can see um, what you need there also a very safe and tolerable drug. You don't want to give somebody who's not you never want to make the disease earlier onset than would be. So you have to make sure that the drug you're using is very safe, 
tolerable, wouldn't accelerate, would have no adverse events or nothing that would make the disease worse. And so there's a lot of work to be done here, but that's the dream. And it at least is in sight. Mm -hmm. It's not achievable today, but it's in sight. And I know for your HDO community, how crucial that is. And, you know, we'll have to wait. A year from now, if we have results for secondary prevention, then you can imagine what the next study would be. But we're not there yet. Uh, we've got to show that we can find some benefit with secondary prevention before we go to really prevention of onset and diagnosis. But that's the dream. And our dreams are always big. Mm -hmm. I think that that's, that's a very nice way of putting it. And you also kind of address, but I'd love to, to dig a little deeper as we, as we start to wrap up the conversation, because I know we can speak for hours about, <laughs> about you and your experiences and the importance of the community. And, and you're such a huge champion for all of us. Um, but as you mentioned, there's been a lot of setbacks, um, a lot of, of people who had extreme hope in, in different trials that um, have, have just had to rethink things. And, you know, even though you mentioned we'll have some results in a year, that's still a year away. What do you tell the community um, to, to keep up that hope and to keep up the fire and the passion um, to continue to help propel everybody forward? What do you say to people who have had a really tough year? Yeah, well, I say I understand. It's been a tough year. And um, it's been a tough year, um, really, for the whole community. So firstly, to acknowledge the grief, to acknowledge the sadness, to acknowledge the uh, hopelessness that some people might feel. But what I would say to the community is nobody's walking away. Nobody, we're learning as much as we can from that failure. We're coming back to new approaches. There are numerous, numerous approaches now being uh, undertaken. The pharmaceutical industry is more in, interested in Huntington disease than ever before. Um, and you know, to do these trials, you need serious amounts of money. That mostly can come from biotech and mostly pharma. And there is investment in this area profoundly. People see if they can have some impact on Huntington disease, maybe it would be even more broadly applicable to other diseases. Mm -hmm. So there's real hope um, that Huntington disease could be a model uh, for treatment of other neurodegenerative disorders. I would say, um, take a moment to express that grief, but then we have to pick ourselves up. We have to keep on going. We have to know that there's numerous other opportunities. This is drug development. It's really tough uh, and it's not totally predictable. Um, and so we may get unexpected delights from areas we didn't expect, and we may get disappointments from areas where we were very hopeful. That's the story of drug development, but nobody's giving up. We will make progress and we will find drugs that in the end, slow progression of HD. It's just a question of when. And I think, as you mentioned, no one has walked away, but I hope people know that no one is alone either. And in these times when things happen that we didn't want to have happen, I think this community above so many others that I've worked with and seen came together in a big way. And so if you are struggling or if you need someone to talk to, let us know. We're here to help and we're here to help connect you. Um, but the community um, from the scientists to the patients and caregivers, to the advocacy organizations, we are all here to support you. And, um, and that's, that's, I hope people feel that because that's such an important thing with Huntington's disease. Yeah, exactly. Well, this has been such an absolute pleasure, Dr. Hayden. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your passion and the work that you do. Um, it's, it's clear to see, it's inspirational, and it makes me feel like there's such hope and, and opportunity. And I hope it's the same for people who maybe um, are in the community who need that extra lift today and, and beyond. So um, thank you so much. And I'll let you close it off with anything additional you'd like to say. I just say it's been a privilege and an honor for me to be able to be working with families and with patients around the world in this disease. Um, it's, in, it's been a profound scientific challenge, 
Uh, it's been an opportunity for me to grow personally uh, and an opportunity to try and translate what we've learned in basic discovery, the research all the way through to opportunities for treatment and prevention. We're on this journey together. And I just thank you to all of you for being partners with me. Thank you so much. And if you wanted to hear a little bit more about Proof HD, that's the clinical trial that has been, uh, the enrollment has completed. Um, Dr. Hayden also presented at the HDO Virtual Congress. So I'll put a link into that video and that will take a little bit deeper diver into the science behind it. But um, so thrilled to have you here today and thank you for all who are watching. Thank you.